you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, my name is Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. We're glad you're watching a Bible answer today. This program is dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God and we've got three gospel preachers with us to do just that. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, my name is Rick Knoll and I'm with the Oak Ridge Church of Christ and preacher there in Obion, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Serge Shoemaker, minister for the Glendale Church of Christ in New Bern, Tennessee. I'm Corey Sawyers and I work with the Bear Valley Bible Institute and the Bear Valley Church of Christ in Denver, Colorado. We're glad to have these brethren with us today and we're glad for so many people to send in their questions. At the halfway point of our program today, we're going to show our contact information and we would very much appreciate uh, you sending us your questions that we might answer them on a future program. Our first question today goes to Brother Sawyers and it's a very good one. How can I derive the most from studying the Bible? Brother Sawyers. Well, I'll tell you, I was very excited to get this question uh, because generally speaking, we do a good job of telling people that they need to study the Bible, but we don't always do a very good job of telling them how to study the Bible. And it's very important for us to do that and think about uh, the, the how to study the Bible class and seminar is one of my favorite things to teach. And uh, so I'm really excited to talk about this material because it always helps me every time that I try to help someone else with it as well. You know, there's no way that honors God any more than with a thorough examination of His Word and accepting it as His Word. So we have to begin by by having the right attitude, that we have an open mind, that we're desiring to know God, that we're desiring to know Jesus, that we're desiring to have faith, and that we're desiring to know what God says and not what we think He should have said. Because there's lots of people that have gone into it without those proper attitudes, that have studied the Bible a lot, but have not gotten what they needed to have gotten out of God's Word. Uh, understand first and foremost that God wants us to understand His Word. Uh, there are a number of passages, Ephesians 5, 17, uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, 2 Peter 3, verse 18, lots of other passages that talk about how that God wants us to grow in knowledge of His Word, that He wants us to understand His Word, and that He expects us to understand His Word. But it does take W-O-R-K work. We've got to work at it. And so, uh, real quickly, I'll just give you four uh, tips on Bible study that uh, will help you hopefully get some more out of, of your Bible study. First of all, learn to think of uh, the Bible in terms of entire books. We oftentimes will skip around as we study and, and uh, kind of dive bomb into verses without looking at the context. So begin to think of it in looking in, 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 in terms of entire books or entire letters. If you can, sit down and read those books in their entirety in one setting or uh, maybe two or three settings if it's an especially long book. Uh, try to identify some things as you're going through that particular book, uh, but use the Bible text only. Now, we're convinced that uh, if we were stranded on an island with nothing but a, a Bible that floated up to us that we could understand exactly what God wants us to do. So there may be some interesting facts we find in other materials, but just stick with what God's Word says. Number two, learn the importance of words. Each and every word is inspired by God. And as you go through reading an entire book or letter, have a notepad beside you and notice the words that He is repeating. Number three, discover the purpose of a book using what I call the four P's. Number one, those predominant words. The, the terms and ideas and words that He's repeating, He's doing so to drive home a point. Uh, if you look at the book of Psalms, for example, Lord is mentioned over 800 times. God is mentioned over 500 times. There are five different Hebrew words for praise that are used over 500 times. So the book of Psalms is all about the psalmist praising God no matter what his situation is. So predominant words, number two, look for those prayers. Whatever a writer is praying about is what's on his heart and what's on his mind and it's what he's going to be writing about. So example, for an example of that is in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, verses uh, 15 through 19, 
as Paul begins that letter, he tells them what he's praying about, and it's the things that he's going to write about in that letter. Number three, be looking for uh, purpose statements. There are a number of times in God's Word that He just tells us, this is what I'm writing this book about. For example, in John chapter 20 and verse 30 through 31, He says that the reason I'm writing these signs that, that He recorded in the book of John is so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah and that by believing in Him you could have eternal life. He just tells us what He's writing it about, so look for those. And then the fourth P is petition verbs. That's a unique type of Greek verb. Uh, in our English translations, they usually are, are rendered as beseech or beg or implore or something like that. When we want to highlight something, we might bold it or underline it or italicize it. This is the way the Greeks did that. And so you look at a book like uh, Romans in chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, I beseech you or I beg you therefore, brethren. And the, the tone of the entire letter changes from that point on. And then after you've gone through and figured out the purpose of a book as you're studying number four, I would suggest that you make personal application. If we're only using the Bible as a textbook, then we are totally missing the point of what it says. As we're studying a passage, we need to be asking ourselves the question, what does this mean for my life, for my marriage, for my home, for my walk with Christ? Uh, how is it going to affect me and how is it going to draw me closer to the Lord? So as you're studying God's Word, try to apply some of these simple principles and hopefully you can get some more uh, out of your Bible study. I appreciate the good question because it's an important topic of our studying God's Word. Thank you. Enjoyed that. Brother Noel, was it the case that Jesus did not want the demons to confess their belief in Him because they would be saved if they did? Brother Noel. Well, the short answer is no. Uh, the demons could not be redeemed. They could not be uh, corrected to uh, be saved at all because they'd already passed this life. These demons were forbidden from speaking uh, to who Christ as to who Christ was because they would be giving some credence to their abilities. And Jesus did not want them to give an alliance to them or to give them any, any form of uh, backing that they were indeed something for, for him to be proud of. In Luke chapter 4, uh, we were told there that the demons uh, would declare who Christ was, and thus they would taunt Jesus until he would command them from those who they possessed. Um, the scribes, they, would come, they came down and they accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, in Mark chapter 3. In fact, in that 22nd through 27th verse there, Mark chapter 3, the scribes, as they came down, they accused these things. He called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And so Jesus was making the, the case that there's no reason for them to think that Satan would cast out Satan because then Satan's fighting against himself. And he said if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And so Satan would be fighting against Satan. The kingdom would not be able to stand talking about the kingdom of Satan because they would be destroying itself from within. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, then will he spoil his house. And in this case, the strong man would have been Satan. Jesus would have been the one that would came, come into that house, and that he would clean the house, and he would destroy him and cause that, that demon to come out. He was able to overpower Satan because Satan just simply did not have that power over him. Uh, what I think one needs to understand is that demons who now possess folks back or back in that day and time, that Jesus uh, refused to change when, uh, when they first had an opportunity with living to, to get their lives straight. But when they pass, there's no coming back from that. Once you pass, your, your eternal destiny is sealed. There's no change from that. Uh, when the Apostle Paul when, was in his ministry, uh, we read in Acts chapter 16 that the Apostle suffered much the same thing when the woman that was possessed of a demon went around and declaring of Paul being a minister and how that uh, Paul was a man that was going to able, be able to bring salvation. And she did much the same thing. And of course, the recognition to give, uh, give Satan that uh, credence or give, that, give Satan some credit as to who he was. They all knew who Jesus was. There was no mystery there. Uh, and the Mount of Temptation, Matthew chapter 4, 
The same thing held true there. The, the tempter came to Jesus and tried to get him to turn the stones to bread. Why? Well, if thou be the Son of God, prove it. Jesus had nothing to prove. Jesus was always able to, to stand against the evil ones and against those scribes, against all those who would try to, uh, to misalign him, try to say things against him. Uh, Paul, if he reasoned uh, uh, with, uh, with the demons and allowed them to carry on and do those things, again, it would give them credence as to who they were, that, that they would be able to spread the same thing as Jesus did. But we know that the demons weren't in the business to encourage Christ, but to discourage and try to undermine his faith and his teaching. Uh, the course that was pursued by Paul and by Christ both was to rebuke these demons, to let those demons know that they need to come out, that they were not going to be able to have that influential power, that they were not going to be able to uphold those things. Um, the first thing that they had to do is permit that there was an alliance between them, and that just could not be the case. The second was a supposed alliance would, be, would have caused all good uh, repute of Jesus and the apostles to reflect upon the demons, and all evil repute of demons to reflect upon them. It was an ingenious effort for the devil to ally himself with Christ. And the difference between Jesus, Jesus and those demons were daylight and dark. They had nothing in common, and they were opposed to each other. Uh, and let's just carry this out. What would have happened if Jesus had not rebuked those demons and cast them out? What would have happened if Paul would not have rebuked that demon that possessed that woman uh, in Acts chapter 10? Well, what we find out that if Christ had done that, they would have given that credence to the demons who would be telling the truth, but then that would also allow them to teach things that were not the truth, but because they were with Christ would indicate or at least give them some uh, uh, ability to, to be, be able to be credited with, well, I'm with Christ and here's something else you need to learn. It could be completely opposite. And so they were nothing but wolves in sheep's clothing. And so that's the reason why Jesus would rebuke them. And Paul and the apostles likewise would do that very thing. Uh, they did not want them to sanction Christ in any form or fashion. Thank you for the question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today we want to offer to you a free track. Our track today is the second in a series called Five Steps of Salvation. This was in, entitled Believe. If you'd like the track entitled Believe, or if you'd like our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course, or both, or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can contact us by our webpage at www.abibleanswertv.org and our past programs are archived there for your viewing as well as on our YouTube channel. Just look for A Bible Answer TV on YouTube and you'll go to our YouTube page. You can also contact us by email at abibleanswer@earthlink.net, or you can call our toll-free number 1-800-436- 0463. Back to our questions today, and now to Brother Shoemaker. We have this question, how did Enoch walk with God? Brother Shoemaker. Enoch's life is described in just four verses. Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Yet twice in those four verses, verse 22 and again in verse 24, we are told that Enoch walked with God. And this is an incredible statement, but what exactly is meant by it? It does not appear to refer to literal walking. That is, God did not physically manifest himself and walk aside uh, Enoch. Rather, it's a, a symbolic walking that's being described. And as we think about that, there, there are two things that I want to focus on. Uh, first is the idea that the term walk is often used in the Bible to refer to a person's matter of conduct how they live their lives. Paul encouraged the Ephesians in Ephesians 5 and verse 15 to look carefully how ye walk, not as unwise, but as wise. He's talking there about pay attention to how you live your life. Show yourself to be a wise person, not an unwise person. So when we talk about Enoch walking with God, we're not talking about his physical gait, but instead we're talking about his manner of conduct. The second key is to consider here that Enoch walked with God. 
The prophet Amos asked a rhetorical question in Amos 3 and verse 3, Shall two walk together except they have agreed? So the idea of Enoch walking with God, it means that his conduct was in keeping with the principles, the commandments, and with the will of God. Enoch was an upstanding, a moral man, and as such he enjoyed close fellowship with God like two people uh, who were friendly walking along together. This understanding is confirmed by other places where similar statements are made. Genesis 6 and verse 9 tells us that Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now keep in mind that Noah lived at a time where every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, according to Genesis 6 and verse 5. Noah was living a righteous life, and so he walked with God. Later, the nation of Israel was enjoined to walk with God through obedience to His laws. God, through Moses, promised, Jehovah will establish thee for a holy people unto Himself, as He has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of Jehovah thy God and walk in His ways. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 9. Now, it's important for us also to note how Enoch's uh, righteous walk, his great faithfulness, was rewarded. Genesis 5 verse 24 tells us that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The Hebrews writer explains this unique phrase by saying, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and he was not found because God translated him. Hebrews 11 and verse 5. That is, as a reward for his faithful life, Enoch was spared from physical death, but was instead translated directly into paradise. And as such, Enoch serves as an example and as a type of the salvation that's offered to all people. Now, I'm not talking about an escape from physical death. That is, we can walk with God today, and yet physically we will still die. But rather, we are promised an escape from the second death of hell. Jesus promised in Revelation 2 and verse 11, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. But again, this is dependent upon how we walk, just like it was for Enoch. Enoch walked with God and was spared physical death. We can walk with God and be spared the, uh, the second death. Paul encourages us in Ephesians 5 and verse 8 to walk as children of light. And John would write in 1 John 1 and verse 7 that if we Walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sins. For all intents and purposes, walking in the light is equivalent to walking with God. Enoch walked with God by virtue of the life that he lived. He kept himself from wickedness, he followed after the commands of God, and as a result, God spared him from physical death. From the example of Enoch, we therefore learn that we too can be delivered if we walk with God. I thank you for asking this good question. Thank you. Now to Brother Sawyers. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says that the Scriptures are not of any private interpretation. Yes, don't we have to interpret them? Brother Sawyers. Verse 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is a private interpretation. Uh, he says this is something that's of primary importance. It's something that we need to talk about, and that's because in verse 19, he had just got through talking about prophecy, and he says, no prophecy, no message is of one's own interpretation. Now, the Greek idea here, the Greek word here, carries the idea of, of explaining something. And what he's been doing is explaining Jesus with the prophecies that that we have in the Hebrew Scriptures. So what he's saying is it's not a matter of a cleverly drawn up tale that they've, they've come up with as, as some may have been accusing the apostles of doing, that they had been misapplying the Scriptures of the, uh, the Old Testament to teach Jesus. He's saying that this isn't something that we came up with, but rather it was something that God has given us. You know, Jeremiah 23 verse 16, Ezekiel chapter 13 verses 2 through 3 are just a couple of examples where it talks about false prophets who were just making up what they were teaching. Peter here is saying true teachers, true prophets do not do that. God reveals it to them. So in this context, what he's talking about is not so much what we're doing with Scripture, but where does Scripture come from? 
Uh, you go back to chapter 1 and verse 16 of 2 Peter, and it says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. That's the same thing that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, that the things I'm writing to you was revealed to me by God. Verse 21 says, For no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but man spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, no prophecy ever began with, I think I'm going to write me a prophecy. It, it all began with God. They were moved. Now what's interesting is that Greek word that's translated moved there is the same word used in, in Acts chapter 27, verses 15 and 17, when it's talking about uh, the ship being blown by the wind. And what a great visual that represents for us today because the Greek word for spirit can also be translated wind or breath. What Peter is saying is that the Holy Spirit filled their sail and they wrote. And, and when you marry that with 2 Timothy 3.16, you get a pretty clear indication of what's going on when Scripture was being given. Uh, he says it's from God. Their message originates with God. It's not from man's will. Now don't let the chapter break throw you because in 2 Peter chapter 2, immediately following this, he's going to talk about those false teachers and what caused them to teach and preach the things that they were doing. What Peter says the apostles and the prophets, were, the true prophets were teaching, uh, was not man's will. It was not man's interpretation. It was God's will. And that's a message that you and I should both pay attention to because 1 John 1 says God is light. He's the only one that can light our paths, but only if we're sticking to what His Word says and not what man says. That's the, why this question is so important and why we need to pay close attention to what the Bible's answer for it is. Thank you for that. Thank you, Brother Sawyers. To Brother Noel, in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, what is the milk and meat of Scripture? Brother Noel. Okay, I'd like to begin by reading that 12th verse of Hebrews chapter 5. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. First of all, the milk of this passage would be the, some of the simplest truths of the, of the first principles of faith, etc. The things that uh, would help you learn that you are guilty of sin. Those things that would help you realize that there is salvation, the simple plan of salvation and what one must do to become a Christian to begin with. And then the growing from that. The strong meat would be some of the weightier matters of the law, some of the weightier things that need to be divulged to you uh, to help you grow stronger. Uh, especially to grow into to being a more mature Christian. The writer of the book of Hebrews was discussing our Savior early on in that passage. He talked about the fact that he had more to teach them. And in verse 11 he points out, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. And so then verse 12 comes with the milk and the strong meat. He tells them this so that they would understand that there's a growing process that needs to go on as far as a Christian is concerned. Once we become Christians, we can't just simply abandon ship. We can't just simply sit idly by. Our work has just begun. We've just begun to be a Christian. We need to grow on into maturity to be able to learn these truths so that in turn we can uh, pass that information along to others as well. I recall in the book of uh, Acts chapter 8, after the great persecution that was going on in Jerusalem, that the saints were scattered abroad everywhere, and we're told that they went everywhere preaching the gospel. And that's exactly what we need today, is to get that word out so that people can know the, and understand the very nature of God, what God expects us to do. We know that the, the scriptures here tells us that, that we need to be skillful in that word in this particular context. And the writer of Hebrews was trying to drive home that point that in verse 1 of chapter 6, that we are to uh, leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. And he doesn't mean sinless perfection here. He's talking about growing up, being a mature Christian, that we are to be stronger day by day so we can impart that information on to others. Also realize that sometimes we have those that do not know and do not understand just the ramifications of what's going on. And God, we need to realize, gives us opportunity after opportunity to further that cause, to teach others of God's goodness and mercy. And that is the reason, I believe, that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, I want you to listen carefully what he tells us here. 
He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, not just somebody sitting idly by, not just somebody listening to words, but a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He expects us to properly handle his word. He expects us to study that word. He expects us to learn that word and to carry it out in our everyday life. So, so many things could be averted if people would just adhere to that truth, if they would just do that very thing to grow thereby. And I hope this answers your question and encourages you to study a little bit more. And thank you for that question. Thank you, Brother Noel. And then we have to Brother Shoemaker this question. Did Jesus ever claim to be God? Brother Shoemaker. Certainly he did. And it's important for us to give full weight to those claims. Jesus claimed the authority of God. In Mark chapter 2, a palsied man was brought to Jesus for healing. And he said, thy sins are forgiven in verse 5. This prompted many of the scribes to become indignant, saying, He blasphemeth who can forgive sins but one, even God. Verse 7. Now, Jesus did not uh, dispute the logic of their argument. Instead, he gave proof that he also had the authority to forgive sins by healing uh, that man's palsy. By accepting worship, Jesus made a similar claim. There's at least three times in the scriptures that we read of the adult Jesus uh, accepting worship. Matthew 4 and verse 10. Matthew 14 and verse 33, uh, John, uh, excuse me, rather, Matthew 8 and verse 2, Matthew 14 and verse 33, and John 20 and verse 28. But the clearest piece of evidence we could cite of this, and the one that we're really going to uh, focus on, is the statement that Jesus made in John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and the Father am one. Now, it's important to note on that occasion, the Jews sought to stone him, according to verse 33, for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. I think it's telling that in the, the face of the prospect of death, Jesus did not backtrack from his claim. He didn't try and say, wait a second, you misunderstood me. Uh, I misspoke. Let me rephrase that. But instead, he actually essentially doubled down on his claim. John 10 and verse 38, Understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Jesus made many such claims, and he backed up those claims with evidence. Uh, thank you for asking this important question. We extend our thanks to each of these brethren today for doing such a good job and answering your questions. And if you have a Bible question, we hope that you will send it in, and we will seek to answer that on a future program of A Bible Answer. In just a moment, you're going to see a list of 40 different congregations which financially support this program. We're so thankful for their support by allowing us to bring this program to you. We're glad that you watched today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the Faithful Church of Christ in your area.